Hey everybody, welcome to the Penske File. I, uh, I've been collecting board games for about eight months now, uh, a little less than a year. So I figured I would give a hand coming uh, up to the end of 2014. I would make a video series where I rank from my favorite or my least favorite to my favorite um, of the games I own so far, just to give you a little taste about what my tastes are, I suppose would be the way to say that. Um, one thing about the board game hobby is people love to make lists. I think Board Game Geek uh, is probably responsible for that just because they have the geek lists and everything. But board gamers love to make lists where they rank things. Video gamers don't really do that for whatever reason. I think they should. It's a nice. It's always nice to have the end of the year best of in those lists. And you read the countdowns and then you disagree really strongly with everything that that person has written and call them an asshole. So uh, I'm going to go from 20 to 1. I have 20 games at this point, I think, with a couple honorable mentions that I haven't played enough to really um, give any kind of feedback about. So I'll go from my least favorite to my favorite. I did this the Tom Vassal way. I just made little um, post-its with a game on each one, and I ranked them out, whether I'd, you know, I'd compare to, say, I'd rather play this one than this one, and eventually they came into some kind of order um, that I fine-tuned after that was done. So that's how this was determined. So we'll start with the honorable mentions coming up now. All right, so the first honorable mention is, as all the others are, I bought these three games, these three honorable mentions, I, and I'll say that a couple thousand more times before the video's over. I bought these at a Cool Stuff uh, Inc. sale. So I don't know if these are on sale, but you have to get to $100 to get the shipping for free, which is a, the great scam of the modern century. This is the first one, Dixit. So these aren't ranked, but let's get that in the camera. Dixit is a, uh, a card game, kind of creative thinking. Everyone gets a bunch of cards, and you throw one out and describe it. And everyone puts out a card face down, they get shuffled together, and the people have to guess who they thought the card was of the person who said the clue. And you get points for how many people guess your clue, guess other people's, and stuff like that. It's a cool game. comes with a bunch of cards. Um, I've only fiddled around with it once. I've barely gotten a game in with it, so I don't really have much to say. But it's very creative. Um, it would probably be good for mixed groups of people who aren't too deep into gaming, so it's fun for that. Fun for creative types and teacher types and things like that. But yeah, Dixit. Um, that's honorable mention number one. Okay, honorable mention number two, Castles of Burgundy. This is a highly ranked game on Board Game Geek, and I played a couple games of it two-player. Uh, let me just put that down right there like that. I played a couple games of this. It supports up to four. It's a um, tile-placing Euro type game. I won't go into too much detail about what these games are. People probably know them. This is more about the ranking. Um, I played a couple games. I like this game. Uh, the artwork is kind of garbage, I think. It's the kind of game, it's like Terra Mystica. I think it's called Terra Mystica. Um, I'm never incentivized to play it just because I don't like the way that the art looks. It's very drab colors. Um, the tiles are hard to tell when they're on the board what's on there if you're just looking very quickly. But it's a, um, it's a really fun game. My wife likes it, which is a good plus. It's good for two people, which is another good plus if you don't always have the people to play a game. You roll two dice and you can do actions based on whatever the dice rolls are. You place tiles, you buy tiles, typical Euro stuff, and you try to get as many victory points as you can at the end of the game. And it's Castles of Burgundy. It's ranked very highly on Board Game Geek, and I can see why. It's probably better with fewer players, I would assume. I would think when it gets up to four players, it's not as good, but I've only played a two player game, so it's hard to say. But it will certainly, when I do this list again next year, this will be moved into probably the top 10, just about how much I like it and how versatile and easy to play it is. So. I'd recommend getting this one. Ignore the art. Took me a while to ignore the art. Every time I look at a picture, I'd be like, I do not want to buy that game. But uh, there's Jump Judge a Book by its cover. I think that's an important lesson for board gaming. And try out Castles of Burgundy. All right, honorable mention number three Fire in the Lake. Let's get this so the glare doesn't look at it. And there it is Fire in the Lake. So this is uh, a coin series game, which is. One in a series of war games um, that's all they all follow the same kind of base mechanics, and there are different settings for each of the games. There's a Colombian War, I think there's a there's a um, Afghanistan War, there's the Castro uh, Revolution in Cuba. This is my first one, Fire in the Lake, Vietnam. The Vietnam uh, setting was probably what drew it to me the most, or drew me to this game over any of the others. And it's the most recent one, so it's always nice to keep up with the Joneses and buy the newest and best and greatest or whatever. I played a couple games of this one. Um, it's a four-player game that each, it's very asymmetric, so the players all do different things. Um, the game is very, it's not difficult, I wouldn't call it difficult, but it's, it takes a long time to learn the rules about what each, um, each group can do. So 
with Fire in the Lake, I've played a couple games solo, uh, at playing as all four people, and that's okay. It comes with solitaire rules, so you can have sort of AI, um, where you you do can, you read through a flowchart and do um, whatever the, the sheet tells you to do after you go through this multi-step flowchart. But I prefer to just play it by myself. I find those flowcharts kind of tedious to go through, especially when you're just learning the game. Maybe once you get a handle on it and you learned it, it would be easier. But I played a couple games solo, and I played an abbreviated game with two other people where I was playing as two roles. And this is such a strange game. It, it, I do like it. Um, I'll probably do a review on it at some point. But it is incredibly difficult to get to know. It's the kind of thing um, the people I was playing with were probably a little bit too casual. It was a lot of a lot of people have the um, the paper open and sort of looking at it like this uh, for the, the hour or two that we actually played. And it's not that I don't think people enjoyed it, but it's a lot to absorb. The rules are very dense. Um, the rule book is not dense at all, but there's a lot of interrelationship between how the pieces play uh, and how the groups play and how the factions work all together. So even when you think you're starting to get it, you eventually go, how do I, how do, I do that again? And you have to consult the rules. And it's, it's a little bit tedious to learn. I think it's a great game. I would love to get a group, dedicated group, that would actually play it every once in a while. I don't know if I have that group, so I don't know. That affects the ranking somewhat, because if I can't play it with people, it's difficult. It's a fantastic game, and I like it. I don't know if this is the kind of thing that the people I know would really be into, but it's a great war game. The coin series, Fire in the Lake, I'd recommend getting it if you're deep into this stuff. The board's awesome. I love the board, and I'll talk more about that with a later game. This is, um, the artwork is... Fantastic. But that's it. Fire in the Lake. We'll move on to number 20 on the list. Okay, number 20. 20 to 1. Starting with the, the, uh, the worst of the, uh, of the group here. Cranium. Let's see if I can get that without some glare. Cranium. I've had this game forever. I think I've had this game for multiple years, and I just keep it on the shelf just because it makes a nice even number of 20. Um, but Cranium's a party game. It combines a whole bunch of other games like Pictionary and Charades and stuff like that. Um, you have teams, and you try to work your way around a little board, get to the end by winning the most challenges um, compared to everybody else. It's okay. It's fine. It's better with alcohol. People who don't like board gaming like to play it a lot more than I do. I think it's a little bit imbalanced. Some of the stuff is impossible to do. Some of it is very easy to do, um, especially the sculpture ones, where you have a little pile of clay and you try to sculpt something. Some of them seem to be virtually impossible. I don't think I've ever seen anybody guess them. And others seem to be very easy. Um, basically like ball of clay and you put the thing down and someone says is that a ball of clay and they get it right it's okay it's good for uh, drinking groups good for stuff like that good for family games I won't get rid of it but I certainly won't play it above any of the other games that are coming up so that's it number 20 is cranium okay number 19 number 19 is zombie dice this little guy what looks like a toilet paper roll but it's actually a game there are uh, I've done a Let's Play for that. I'll maybe put a link or something in. But the game comes with a bunch of these little dice um, that have multiple sides. And it is a push-your-luck game where you roll a bunch of dice. You get different results based on what you roll. And you're trying to get brains and you're trying to avoid shotguns. And so you push your luck, push your luck with rolls until you get as many brains as you want. And you try to avoid getting three shotguns cumulatively. And then when uh, you either pass and you score the points or you hit three shotguns and you fail, you lose all your points and it goes to the next person. And you try to get to like 15 points or something like that. Um, it's a good game. It's good for determining first player because it takes about five minutes unless you're extremely unlucky with the rolls or you're pushing your luck too hard. Um, it's really quick, really easy. You don't need a lot of space and people like to roll dice. Um, it's good for turn order. If you want to play a game to determine who goes first in another game afterwards, I would recommend it for that. I'm not going to spend hours um, thinking about this game or writing about it or making videos on it, but it certainly suits my purposes for a quick, easy thing. The case is a little big. You probably put in a little Ziploc bag. You don't need this, this actual tube. But yeah, zombie dice. What else can you say? You roll some dice, have some fun. Okay, number 18. Number 18, we're soaring through this. Number 18 is Koo. Show that guy right there. Little box. Coup is probably the game on this list that I have the most, um, I don't even know if it's controversial. I posted on Reddit that someone started a thread that they, the most overrated game or something. This is my choice for most overrated game. It's still number 18, so it's, I'd prefer to play it than the other two that we just passed. But um, I think this game has a lot of reputation that I'm not really sure it deserves. I find it the mechanics to be really sloppy. Um, 
it's a card game where you have hidden identities and you try to guess what other people are. Um, and all the identities give you special abilities that if you have the card you can do, and if you don't, you can lie and try to do the special ability anyway, and people call you out, and if they call you out twice, you're out of the game. Um, the mechanics are a lot of... When I play it, I always wonder if I'm playing this game correctly. I, I know I am at this point. I've reviewed it enough, but it always it feels very clunky when you accuse someone and they say, no, are you the wrong person, or no, I'm not at all that person, or I have a, I have a card that deflects what you're accusing me of. There's a lot of back and forth. And it feels every game always starts out with one card. There's a card called the Duke where that people play it endlessly at the start because it gets you a lot of money. And then it breaks down to one person just eventually um, accuses another person of not being a Duke because they're about to get to the amount of money that they need to do an instant kill on another person. And that person accuses that person and they either are or aren't. And that's the basis of the whole thing. If they are the Duke, the other per the person accusing them loses a point. If they aren't, they lose a point. And from then on, it just sort of spirals around like that. I don't find... Um, I think there are better social deduction games than this one. People seem to really like this game. It's very easy to learn, very easy to set up. I think the mechanics are clunky, and my non-gaming friends really like this game, where people who are familiar with games do not like this game. So that's what it is. Cool. Not one of my favorites, but small box, easy to teach, two to six players takes 15 minutes, it's very quick, very easy to take around, and non-gaming people like it, I think because of the luck factor. There's a lot of luck in this. Okay, cool, number 18. All right, number 17 is Sorrow of the Seas. Throw this guy up here. There it is. Sorrow of the Seas. So Sorrow of the Seas is a sequel of some kind to Sorrow, which is the, the same, um, similar idea, but it's a little bit different. There's different rules, different box. But you basically have um, pieces on a board that you lay down tiles that have paths on them and your piece moves along the path. So you're trying to stay on the board for as long as possible because eventually you'll hit points where other people will have laid down tiles and you'll have to place the tile and if it's the only one you have and it shoots you off the board and that's the end of it for you. Um, Sorrow of the Seas takes that exact formula and adds dragon tiles or their daikaiju or something that they call them. Um, they add these tiles to the game that are uh, related to dice. You roll dice and it randomly either moves, puts dragons down or moves them around the board and they sort of crush or destroy tiles that they move past, and, uh, including ones that people are already on. So it's a little bit of randomness in addition to trying to avoid the dragons as opposed to the original Sura where you're just trying to stay on the board. This one's a little bit more random with the dragons coming out and moving around, taking people out. And this game is... I'm not a huge fan of it. It's two to eight players, plays a lot. It's very easy to learn, very simple, but the luck factor is so big on this. And I feel with less people, the game takes too long. With more people, it's a little bit better. But playing this with two people is a very drawn out affair where the dragons always just get you in the end and it, it comes down to a dice roll. You roll badly and that's the end of the game. Um, I'd probably, I've never played the original Sura. You could play it with this board and just take out the dragon pieces. Um, I would rather play the original, I think. It seems like a more pure sort of strategy game where the dragons add a lot of luck into this. I'm not a big fan of that. So that's it. Sorrow of the Seas. There he is. I do like the box art, though. It's cool. Nice color. Let me get that actually on the camera. There's so much glare. So much goddamn glare. So that's it. Sorrow of the Seas. Number 17. All right. Number 16 is a big favorite. It's a game I played a very long time ago. Ticket to Ride. This is probably one of the modern classics that um, you can get anybody who's not into board gaming to play. Um, I played this a long time ago before I started getting into the board gaming stuff. A friend or roommate had it. We played a lot of games of this. I liked it back then. And everyone who has not gotten into board games likes this game just because of how easy it is to absorb. There is strategy. But it's not overwhelming. You can't really get screwed. It's hard to tell how well you're doing against other people sometimes. Um, people can block each other, but it's not really that intense. So it's a train lay uh, tile game where you are trying to connect, you're trying to build cards in your hand that complete sets of colored tracks along the map. And then you put the trains down, you score points for putting trains, and you score points for connecting certain cities that you have on other cards that are secret. So it's about collecting card color, cards of the same color, putting down trains, connecting cities, and you score points. It's very easy, and um, it's a great gateway game. It is that. I, I, 
I think it's a fantastic way to get people to play. It's easy with family and all that. I don't really like to play it all that much. Um, we've played it enough. I think the strategy is a little bit weak. I don't like how little you can interact with people in terms of um, you don't really know what people are doing. So if you block someone, you usually do it by accident. Unless I'm sure if you're really into the game, you could probably memorize the route cards or something like that, but I am not going to be doing that. So you don't really have a strategy of how you can block people. It's really just you're collecting cards and trying to just do whatever you can. And whoever gets the luckiest sort of draw is eventually going to win the game, which is fine. I think it takes a little bit too long for that, for how um, simple the game is. I wish it was like 25% shorter. Um, this is the Europe map. There's a whole bunch of maps you can get. It's good. It's fun. It's easy. It's not complicated at all, so you can play and talk and not really lose concentration on what's going on. I just am not a huge fan of the lack of interaction that you have going here and the fact that there is sort of a strategy to just collecting cards at the start and just collect, 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 and then when the game is almost over, start laying down some track, um, which seems kind of silly to me and doesn't seem like a fun way to play the game, but it is viable and it works out exactly the same as the... Um, the other method of collecting cards and then putting down a track collecting cards. So that's it. It's a great gateway game, a modern classic, and I can't really complain about the game. I just don't like it. But that's it. Ticket to ride.